Today is the 7th of July 2021. My name is Norbert Mein and I'm here in York with Eva Fox Gahl, the daughter of the composer Hans Gahl. Hello Eva and thank you very much for having us today. Hello Norbert, thank you. So we're here today to speak about your father's life and, and work and also in the, in the context of our project about music and migration, about his time in Britain in particular. But I'd love to start with uh, hearing a bit about your own life. So could we please start by saying uh, when and where you were born? So I was born in Edinburgh, um, just towards the end of the war. And um, yeah, I was born and bred in Edinburgh. So I, I was at school in Edinburgh and at university in Edinburgh. And what did you study at university? I studied modern languages and then specialised in German. So I think I already then had, um, you know, an interest in my parents' culture, but also a streak of laziness that I thought German was probably what I would most easily do well in. Because if I'm honest, you know, in my first year I did psychology, um, as well. In, in Edinburgh you had to do multiple subjects, so it was French and German and another. And I loved the psychology, but I couldn't actually have gone on into second year because of things like statistics that, um, you know, really were an absolute trial. Mm. I just got through that. I couldn't have done more. I presume you spoke German at home then? We always spoke German in the house and spoke English out of the house. But I mean, what, what, just coming back to what I, uh, what I studied, I have subsequently used every bit of my studies. So I specialised in German, and my job at York University, where I was a lecturer, um, was uh, specifically to be able to offer German literature, which they didn't have. Uh, at that time in the Department of English and Related Literature. But in that department, I also um, had opportunity to teach French literature quite a lot. And um, uh, it was kind of what everyone had to do in the department was to teach English. So although I'd only done one year at university of that, that was also part of what I did. And the psychology is more related to what I do now. As, as, as a homeopath, so nothing wasted. And now homeopathy does have uh, some history in your family, I believe. It does, but I don't know. Uh, I was a little aware of it, perhaps not completely, but the fact is that my father's father was a doctor homeopath and he, um, he married into a homeopathic practice. So um, his father-in-law was a homeopathic doctor. So yes, um, uh, the, the, and I think on the, on the um, other side as well, there were just doctors galore. Um, but that skipped a generation with my father. And um, then I kind of, as my second career changed quite nice to change at that stage of your life. So your father was born in 1890 in, uh, well, near Vienna. I, in the, or, the outskirts, in, or in of, the outskirts Vienna. of Vienna. Yeah. His room in the flat in Vienna, which was in central Vienna, after your family had moved there, uh, was used as the waiting room for the homeo homeopathic students. Uh, no, 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 the students, not the, the patients. So, yeah. um, so can, can you, what, what do you know about the, the childhood? Basically, um, the fact that he was born outside Vienna was simply because his birthday was on the 5th of August when the family had their summer holidays yeah. and they actually occupied a, um, um, a flat in Heiligenstadt, more or less diagonally across the road from the Beethoven house where he wrote the um, Heiligenstädter Testament. I presume uh, Brunn was the nearest, um, nearest hospital, which is why he was born there. But basically he's one of the few Vienna-connected composers who actually was from central 
Vienna. I mean, Schubert was uh, was an, was another, and um, yes, it was certainly um, a small uh, flat for four for four children. So he got used to very early age to having to concentrate in very little space. And while his sisters, three sisters, practiced the piano in the in the adjoining room. So his actual bedroom had to be cleared every day uh, as the waiting room. And then his workroom was in a linen cupboard where there was just space for a desk and a chair between, you know, a linen cupboard and another cupboard. There were other musical members in the family. I mean, his aunt Jenny um, became an opera singer and she was working in my hometown of Weimar, actually. There was a lot of music in the family. Yes and no. I mean, she was the one who discovered my father's talent, that he had absolute pitch, and she was the one who suggested that the children, which meant him and his um, elder sister, who was just one and a half years older, should have piano lessons. So that started the piano playing, but his mother was deaf, so the sister of the opera singer, there were only the two of them, Ilka and Jenny. Um, Ilka seems to have had an accident in infancy. Maybe she was dropped from a table or something when, when she was being changed. I mean, I vaguely have a feeling of something like that. In any case, she grew up deaf. Uh, so however musical she was, that was not expressed. Though she was... Uh, very interested in the visual arts and encouraged my father to draw. It was Jenny who um, was a celebrity singer, a celebrity soprano, um, by the time she was 20. Um, she was actually um, having, um, you know, visiting performances and, and um, singing um, in the opera house as a sort of in interlude, as a kind of extra. Uh, she, she, she sang and then she um, was appointed to, uh, to Weimar as an opera singer. But that was fairly short-lived because when she became engaged, um, it was not considered fitting, presumably by her husband's, her prospective husband's family, for a woman to be engaged to a theatre. And so her contract had to be broken off. She sang for the Archduke and, um, and taught, but it was th the end of her operatic career fairly young. But mm -hmm. she was appointed, I think, at the time when uh, Strauss was conductor there. And she earned more, or so, so, so I'm told. I mean, she earned 10 Reichsthaler per, per month. And, and he had three, if I remember rightly. So, um, but it was short-lived. Yes, it's, that, that's very rare nowadays that the, yes. the singers earn more than the conductor. So because of Jenny's discovery of his musical ability, mm -hmm. he did get a very good musical education. Not but at the beginning. He got totally run-of-the-mill piano teachers who didn't inspire him in the slightest. It actually wasn't until he was 15 that he came to a real piano master. And that was only thanks to his sister, Erna, who was nine years younger than him. So he had one who was sort of one and a half years older, one who was six years younger, and then Erna, who was nine years younger. And when he was 14, it was one of his jobs. He had already started having to earn money at that point, and teaching was what he did. And one of his pupils was Erna. By the time she was six, she was considered um, a child prodigy, a wunderkind, and it was because of her that both children then came to a um, very highly regarded piano teacher, Richard Robert, um, who had been a student of Bruckner's and you know, had uh, he taught uh, Clara Haskell, he taught Georg Sell. So 
basically, this musical education did get him to the point where he could actually teach himself and uh, he, uh, your father, and uh, he then actually became a teacher of harmony and piano at the new Vienna Conservatoire. Yes, I mean, he got his, his teacher's diploma um, in 1909, so he would have been 18, um, as a sort of completion, and his teacher, Robert, um, had, I think, just become director of the um, Neues Wiener Conservatorium, so a new conservatory. There are two mm -hmm. institutions in, in, in Vienna and, and major ones, and um, he appointed uh, Hans to teach um, harmony and piano and he in also, 1909 yeah. already. Yeah. And he also introduced him to Eusebius Mandeshevsky. That was who his most important. Was a very important yeah. mentor for you. That father. was the most important influence in my father's life, without any doubt. Um, I mean, it's interesting that all all his at, and at the same time, he was a student at the university because his father would not really have considered um, it acceptable for his son to embark on a, a, a dubious career as a musician, uh, which by the time he left school my father would have wanted to do and would have gone straight to an opera theatre probably as a repetitor and to become a conductor. But that wasn't to be. He went to university so he would get a doctorate. So. Uh, uh, that, so all of that was at the, at the same time after the end of school. And we're talking uh, 1909, 1910, yes, 1909. so the time before the First World War. Yes, all before the First World War and, and his um, teacher at the university was Guido Adler, um, who uh, had, I think, uh, quite a close friendship with Mahler and was a very eminent music historian. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, those three teachers, Richard Robert, uh, Eusebius Mandichewski, and um, Guido, Adler. Guido Adler, were all born within six years of each other. So I think between um, 1855 and 1861, which and is interesting. They're, they're all of that generation and with deep roots in the in in the tradition uh, so this the dual uh, sort of musical career in 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 practical music making as a composer and a pianist and in uh, in academic music with music history through Guido Adler it's there from the right, very beginning in your father's life it isn't is it? Mm. it would not have been his favorite thing to go to university it's not what he would have done but um, I think he enjoyed a great deal of freedom at the university and in the Faculty of Arts and um, was highly regarded by Guido Adler and my father says he had the wonderful uh, quality of if, if a student was talented he just let him do his thing and actually it was the same with his teacher Richard Robert I mean he recognized that that Hans was much more interested in score playing than in um, the sort of finesse of being a concert pianist. So he's an extremely proficient pianist, but you know, his teachers respected where he was coming from. So th th those were three very fine teachers. And yes, you know, each one of those laid the foundation for future potential. But also then uh, success came quite quickly for him as a composer. Yes. And uh, so he, he, you know, he, he had some of his work performed. There was, for example, already in April uh, 1915, there was a concert exclusively with your father's music in the Musikverein in Vienna. And also in 1915, he won the state prize for composition. Yes, and actually already before, I think that was already... Um, uh, there was already quite an important concert in 1912 um, 
it, it, there were already a number of things from before the first uh, uh, before the first world war so the first world war really was a complete disruption to where he already was yeah. if so, i'm not mistaken uh, there was already a concert entirely of his music before the first world war so vienna's leading performers and venues already featuring uh, your father's music and then you know, the, the first there were several sort of setbacks in his life, I think it's fair to say. I mean, I suppose that's true for almost anybody of his generation. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, it would have been a very big disappointment. But it's also um, interesting that he, later on, I, I, I understand he referred to this time before the First World War as a sort of um, tryout period. And he didn't actually publish a lot of the works that were performed then. And he kind of changed them and held them back. And then eventually, even during the First World War, um, you know, really some of the compositions were then published uh, for the first time uh, I around then. I think the point is that um, although the First World War he saw as an absolutely shattering blow, um, that the one good thing about it, in his words, was um, that it gave him the detachment from his early work um, so that he didn't rush into publication. But for instance, his Opus One was published immediately von Ewiger Freude, so a choral um, work with, I think, four part women's voices, two harps and organ. A number of the works that were subsequently published do stem from before the First World War, including, for instance, the Heurigen Trio, um, which was written almost immediately before, before the war. Because um, he takes that as an example of um, how carefree um, uh, the youth of the day uh, were in, um, when they were on the brink of everything falling uh, falling apart because it's a, a humorous trio. Also um, the five intermezzi for string, string quartet and several choral works are um, actually from before the First World War. However, the publication for the most part wasn't till afterwards and that's where he sifted very carefully what he retained and what he didn't and was very hard on himself. And then he actually had to serve in the army during the First World War and he had active service in Serbia. But also during the First World War some of his music was performed and in yeah, 1916 yeah. the Rosé Quartet, which is the, you know, Arnold Rosé was the mm. leader of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra uh, and of course a very, very revered chamber musician as well. Yeah. You know, they would have performed his first string quartet then. Yeah, yeah. And then just after the war, uh, the first opera uh, being performed uh, in Breslau, uh, Der Arzt der Zubaide. Yep. Uh, what's that like? That's an opera I've never heard because it's not been performed since. And I'm not sure that Universal Edition even have usable material. Certain numbers out of that opera were frequently performed in concert in those early years. So I imagine that it's, it's very attractive. I mean, his, his vocal music um, is probably what was developed earliest to a level that he accepted, because as I say, a, a number of choral works are, are early. But yeah, that one was actually largely written while he was in active service. But he, he had volunteered for a very isolated outpost in the Carpathian Mountains where a railway had to be built. And I mean, he liked skiing and so on. And I think that was a safe, much safer place to be. And that's where he also made a lot of progress with his 
opera. So basically returned from the First World War with a virtually completed opera in his rucksack and presumably only had to do a fair copy. And then Julius Prüver, who I think had connections with Vienna, was evidently shown it and accepted it. But it's remarkable that it was already performed in 1919. Um, when he was in his late 20s, yes. 1919, yes. yes. He, he would be uh, 29, yes. And then the, the period after the, second, uh, after the First World War, of course, up till 1933, when he you know, lost his position in Mainz in the Conservatory, we will talk about that later. Um, you know, that would, be, would have been a really, really successful, very, very full uh, you know, period in his life. Um, it was, but it was also a very, very hard period because of the political situation in Austria, which is absolutely devastated by the First World War. I mean, Austria had lost everything. It had lost its entire hinterland. The, the, um, its economy um, collapsed. The, the political situation was a state of ruin. And then in 1922, the inflation hit really hard, so that if you taught a piano lesson in the morning, you had to spend the money that afternoon if you still wanted to buy a loaf of bread. So it was, it was as bad as that. Um, so basically, he had to do about five different jobs, but fortunately, he was able to do that. So there was piano teaching and accompanying. He did a lot of professional accompanying of leader and uh, chamber music. Um, he... Uh, he got a job at Vienna University teaching um, harmony, counterpoint, form, the technical subject, but um, that was not even paid in the first year and very poorly paid after that. But apparently that's a job that Bruckner had previously held. Um, he edited about a hundred miniature scores for Universal Edition in the then new Philharmonia series. Um, I just brought some of those uh, back, back to York from, uh, from Edinburgh. Some of them he didn't even sign, um, others just have an HG, but because everyone else who did any of these signed their name, it's fairly clear which ones were by Hans Gahl, and I can always tell from the way he writes because there's a kind of straightforwardness about the prose which doesn't sound particularly literary but is very succinct and very to the point and I suppose it's the language I've grown up with but I do kind of recognize his style and it's very very as I say very very succinct but I mean that was hack work um, a hundred of, of, of those, you know, almost the whole of Beethoven, for instance, yes. every string quartet, the symphonies, Missa Solemnis, um, Schubert symphonies, you can't begin to imagine it, serious editing work. However, Vienna had these manuscripts. So, so yes, the academic work uh, was very early. Um, I mean, his early training served him but he also wrote music. He was responsible for music for the Neue Wiener Bühne, one of the theatres. So incidental in music for the theatre. Uh, yes, whatever was needed. And that's where he met his later librettist. Um, von Lebetzow. Yeah. Uh, yes, von, uh, uh, he, he wrote the music for a play by him, uh, Ruth. Um, so, you know, it was... and a huge amount of teaching as well. You know, I mean, the, the, the work, work at the university too. And you said that already, you know, about him, that he was able to, when he was composing, to shut out all the distractions that were there, uh, just so he was able to focus and, uh, you know, achieve that clarity of mind. And it, I can understand that at that time, it would have been a very, very useful skill to have. Uh, very I mean, useful. as in most, during most of his life, I suppose, um, and the other point 
to make I think, in, in connection with you know the, the huge variety of work is of course that it would have given him enormous insight into the, the music he edited so he must have known you know Beethoven and Schubert inside, inside out. out well I mean the thing is that his dissertation was on um, characteristics of style in the early Beethoven and its relationship to his maturity, Stil-Eigentümlichkeiten. So that, uh, yes, I think he made it his business from very early on really to immerse himself in scores so that he knew that music from the inside. And that's another thing that I recognize in his own um, miniature scores is that that little introduction always places the work in a wider context either of that composer's work or yes a different version by him or or whatever so yeah a huge huge inside knowledge of of music so i think the capacity to do the jobs arose from him already having that capacity. Otherwise, I can't see how he could conceivably have done it. But then, of course, you know, during that very busy time, also a lot of other compositions, you know, saw the light of day. Yes. And we've already mentioned Levitsov, and uh, of course, there were two major operas that were written in the 20s. Mm. Uh, that's the Die Heilige Ente, yep. the Holy Duck, if I... So, but it's a very interesting, it's a, it's a, you know, Chinese uh, setting. Sujet, uh, setting and it's, it's a very, um, yeah, it's a very powerful opera that has recently been uh, revived. And just before the pandemic, there were performances of that in Germany. One, um, one, one premiere and six cancelled performances. But it did have its premiere. It That's... had its premiere after... Well, it was the first performance since 1933 with full orchestra. Well, that's wonderful. And hopefully that will be revived at some hopefully, stage. Hopefully, yes. Um, yes. And, uh, and then the other opera, Das Lied der Nacht. Um, it, uh, could you say a bit about that, about that? Yes, well, I mean, that um, after the success of Die Heilige Ente, um, which was an, an immediate success. And that was premiered um, almost at the same time as Turandot by Puccini, which... One day before Turandot. And it is, it has and a rather so similar, similar uh, setting, uh, doesn't it? it? it the mm. setting is similar, the music is is very different. Das Lied der Nacht, yes, so, so there was kind of pressure to get on with it, but Levitzo had disappeared um, and my parents had to pursue him in Corsica, where he was living. He was real bohemian and um, homosexual, which was presumably not allowed, etc., etc. So I think um, that was one reason why he probably escaped to Corsica. Certain bits of Das Lied der Nacht were kind of sketched out, sitting on Levitzo's bed in, in the hut where they, where they were in, in Corsica. Well, he must have had a very single-minded um, you know, conviction that, that he was the right librettist for him. He so, apparently to pursue him. Yep, would not look at any other librettist, even though he was wooed by many. It, it had to be Levitzo. Now so they, they're very compatible. It's something about, um, I think, the combination of a deep humanist education, um, classical humanist ed um, um, knowledge and, and education and intellect and a very strong sense of humour. And the two obviously um, connected on that on that level, yeah. Now you mentioned your your your, your mother already. I mean, because your, your parents had to go and track down Levitzow, but uh, we haven't actually spoken about her yet. So in 1922, your parents got married in in Vienna. At the height of the inflation. 
So, I mean, she was given money as a wedding present, just disappeared. And they were also given furniture, which we still have. So that sort of thing was provided by my grandparents, who were, who were well-to-do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was her background? I mean, you said they were well-to-do, but did they, um, did she, what sort of education did your mother have? And what's the background? My mother um, was very intelligent and probably quite intellectually precocious, but very much affected by the start of the First World War. She was born in 1902 and um, several of the, the boys in her class um, were killed in the war in those early years. So I think that was quite a shadow. Um, her mother um, was an artist and a sportswoman, though both, I suppose, for a married woman could not be kind of pursued professionally. But she also had, in a way, a little bit like a salon um, in, in their house in Vienna. I mean, they were really from Prague, but when my mother was six, they moved to, to, to Vienna and her parents had a Bauhaus designed house in a very good part of Vienna, Die Hohe Warte. It was really through a musician who was staying in my grandmother's house to recover from an illness or an operation, I can't remember. Um, and my, this pianist was someone my father knew and to sort of, you know, cheer her up during this convalescence, my father came and visited the house and my mother was 18, had just finished school and um, had been given a sort of, sort of six-week holiday in, in Sweden. And when she came back, this pianist said, what would you like us to play for you? We'll, we'll arrange some chamber music. What would you like to hear? And my mother said, um, piano quartet by Hans Gahl. She hadn't met him yet. And so she had obviously heard that um, in 1920 at its first performance and been sufficiently impressed by the piece to request it. And this Louise Wandel, the pianist, uh, duly uh, performed that and other works. And on the cello was Hans Gahl who she met for the first time. And her mother had um, arranged to paint a portrait of my father. And then my mum was um, used to keep him occupied while he had to sit for this portrait. And within six weeks, they were engaged. But they weren't allowed to get married right away because um, my grandmother felt my mother was still too young, so she had to wait till she was 20. My, my grandmother knew my father before my mother knew him. So perhaps we can talk a little bit more about um, the chamber music and also further choral works and orchestral works from the 1920s. I mean, this, must, this was a, a very, very creative period in Vienna. Very. And of course, we know that your father had connections with uh, Alban Berg and uh, Webern and uh, also New Korngold and Karl Weigel, the conductor and uh, composer as well. So uh, what, what major works from this period would, would, should we mention? Overture to a Puppet Play was probably the most widely performed. I believe it had about 100 performances. So, Overture zu einem Puppenspiel. Puppenspiel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, that was conducted um, uh, by Fort Wengler, Busch, Kalbert, and so on. That, that had eminent uh, conductors. The first, I, I'm, I'm now on orchestral, the first symphony that he recognized, um, that uh, was composed in 1927 and published in 28. Um, and that was widely performed. Chamber music, um, the First World War, uh, the um, First 
published string quartet, which was actually his fourth quartet, but the first published is from the First World War. But the second, I think, is uh, a very major string quartet, is from 1929. His piano trio um, from 24, I think, is again uh, an important chamber, very important chamber work. And the divertimento for winds, um, and then choral works again amongst the most important are the motet and the five epigrams um, to uh, uh, five madrigals to epigrams by Lessing, which were performed at one of the Tonkunstler. Festers, so the festivals of annual festivals of new music of the German Society for Music. And then, so the operas also got performed. And the, two, the most important thing, very much in the centre at that time, were the operas, and that made the biggest difference to his career. I mean, that was a real breakthrough from Die Heilige Ente because that was subsequently taken on by six other theatres for the next season and really received um, performances all over the place and stayed in the repertoire until 1933. It was, it was being performed in Mainz mm -hmm. in that 32-33 <coughs> season. So, um, das, das Lied der Nacht then premiered in 26. So they were very important. And his last opera was written in the early 30s and due to be performed in 33. And that's the one that didn't happen. Um, so, and piano music, again, I think um, within that genre, his suite, and his piano are two major works, and the major work, probably the only major work he wrote for organ, is the Toccata. All that is from the 20s. So when and how he did it, I don't know, but he did. Because he also was working on the complete Brahms edition still? Was that this? was, well, that was um, very intensive work in 1926. That was all done within a couple of years, I think, with Mandichevsky and um, my father did the instrumental work and Mandichevsky the vocal works. That was concentrated in a very short time. But he had also edited other things for Guido Adler in his Denkmäler der Tonkunst series, for instance, on, on Strauss, father and, and son. So, Somehow or other, alongside everything else, he um, uh, did all sorts of editing. Also his teacher, Richard Robert, who'd been working for 10 years on the Goldberg Variations, died in, in the 20s, I think, 1924 he died, and my father took that over. And also, I saw from our miniature scores, uh, he, he edited the musical offering and the art of fugue. He did those in this country, so... Uh, but one can see how um, the, uh, the tools of the trade had already been developed very early on, which is why he was able to do these things. So, yes, the 20s were an immensely productive time, but... Um, uh, very, very hard work to make ends meet at all. And I don't think he could have done it without those day jobs. And he chose to do that in order to maintain his independence as a composer. That's why he did all these other jobs, to, to maintain that freedom. He was, I, I presume they moved into a apartment of their own in Vienna, at, at your, your parents' then? Yes, yes. What comes to mind when also with the connections with uh, Guido Adler um, is the, the composer Egon Welles, who later on, of course, also mm -hmm. lived in Britain, mm -hmm. um, in some ways had a also parallel 
uh, sort of life because he also got involved in, in both academic uh, and, uh, you know, as, did they but know the, each other then already? I, they probably knew, knew each other, but Velas's emphasis was very different because he chose to go to Oxford and to pursue his interest in Baroque music. So in early music, um, my father absolutely clearly um, was a composer first and foremost and did these other things um, when opportunity required it, um, uh, initiated it, what, whatever, but uh, it was very clearly secondary for him, which doesn't mean he didn't do it to the absolute best of his ability, but um, he, he, it was very different from Velis choosing to, to take up an appointment in Oxford. So now in 1929, and your father would then be in his late 30s, and having ha done all this amazing work, having had these successes, he applied for a job uh, at the Conservatoire in Mainz, and with the support of some eminent musicians, did get, get the job and moved his uh, family to Mainz. Uh, yes, in, yeah. he probably wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for the death of Mandichevsky in 1929. And I, I believe someone else made him aware that there was this vacancy in Mainz. So he, he applied, but yes, very, very eminent referees. Uh, certainly Ford Fengler in, 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 in included, and um, possibly Richard Strauss as well. They already have, uh, your brothers, were they any of them born already in Vienna? The eldest son was born in 23, January 23, and the second one in August 24. So they so, were growing up during that time already? Absolutely, yes, yes. They were at school in, in a very nice school in Mainz and friends with the Bürgermeister's children, uh, who was also removed from office when Hitler came to power. And it must just have been such a major shock suddenly to be subhuman and... Um, and I think some teachers also then treated them badly. But it had been really a, a lovely time for them so up he to had then. Just over three years, basically, in this position in in Mainz as the director. Uh, December of the twenty nine until March thirty three, mm -hmm. and his um, contract had just been fine, had been renewed in February thirty three for another um, two years. And uh, could we say a bit more? I mean, I know that, you know, uh, Gahl is still remembered very fondly in Mainz now, um, but um, obviously there was a huge uh, rupture at the, when, when, when Hitler came to power. But the time before, um, could you say a bit more about what, what he did in that time in Mainz and what, uh, how, what the conservatoire uh, was like under him? Yeah, I mean, he was immensely active there. Um, he um, recalls that there were about a thousand students and 70 members of staff. Um, my father conducted the major ensembles himself, like the, um, uh, the main choir and the main orchestra. Um, he also instituted um, compulsory chamber music for all string players and compulsory vocal chamber music for all singers. And he founded a, a madrigal choir and a women's choir as, 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 as well. Um, he taught the theoretical subjects, harmony, counterpoint, um, form, and, um, and even had some piano students. So what was the administration plus teaching, plus con conducting the major ensembles and therefore preparing for um, a concert? I mean, for instance, the day after he got his letter of dismissal, there would have been 
um, a, a concert with big choral work. I can't remember whether it was a Verdi Requiem or what it was. Something, something big with chorus and orchestra, which he could no longer perform. But I think the fact that um, all instrumentalists had to involve themselves in string quartets and, and all singers in vocal ensemble is very indicative of where he was coming from, which is music making, listening actively from the inside, as opposed to pressing a button and having a radio in the background or gramophone or whatever. At the same time, he was also on the selection committee of the Allgemeine Deutsche Musik Verein, which I always find hard to translate, this German society of music that I've already mentioned that organised the annual concerts of new music. And that's where he served with Alban Berg and Ernst Toch on that committee during those, during those years. And for all their differences as, as composers, apparently he and Berg, you know, always used to agree on the relative merits or demerits of a submitted score um, for these annual concerts. And they sometimes exchanged pupils, you know, if uh, deputised for one another. Also, there are important compositions from that, uh, from that period. I mean, not least his fourth, his fourth opera, but also a ballet suite uh, for orchestra and um, uh, uh, something called Der Zauberspiegel, the magic mirror, which was composed for, um, as a sort of children's, a Christmas fairy tale. And so, in a way, it's a play, but with 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 music, which also was was um, premiered in Breslau, which had previously premiered um, Der Arzt des Obed in the first opera. It had was one of the very early performers of Heilige Ente after its premiere, and it um, premiered Das Lied der Nacht. So in Breslau, he was so well known and, and well regarded that one year after, I think one year after the performance of Die Heilige Ente, I, I think they took that in 24 and it had been premiered in 20, 23 in Dusseldorf. Um, they then um, put on, they devoted a whole evening at the theatre to a sort of carnival parody of Die Heilige Ente called Die Heilige Rente von ganz egal. So <laughs> the, the holy, the holy uh, pension, pension <laughs> by, um, by whoever, whoever, ganz egal, by whoever. By whoever. Yes. <laughs> so the, in the fourth opera you mentioned, the, the Biden class, was also just about to be premiered in Dresden with Fritz Busch conducting. Yes. And uh, of course, that also didn't come to anything as, as the Nazis came to power. Um, now, the, the, the reason why he was removed, of course, is that he was Jewish. Now, could you just say a bit about the role that Jewishness played in, in his life at all? And was that at all something that, that was, uh, you know... Only if you accept the uh, racist definition that um, is, is discriminating against people through their birth. But if you understand Jewishness as a religion, he was not religious. He, he did not... Um, uh, really accept any religion for himself. I would say, but, but on the other hand, he, um, he never took on any other religion. So he wouldn't have said he was um, a, a, a Protestant or anything like, uh, like that, because he wasn't. He, he was just um, not a religious believer, but he remained loyal to the Hebrew community in Edinburgh. He paid his dues. Every year he gave talks for them if they asked for it. 
and, 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 and so on. But religious, no. On the other hand, um, he had a quasi-religious belief in the validity of the greatest music. And also, I think, an almost transcendental kind of more spiritual relationship to nature and certainly to music. So those were supreme and enduring values for him, yeah. not relative ones. The fact that he had these Jewish roots, you could say, or that he yeah, was... he never know, denied. He was of Jewish descent. He, he would have put it that way. And that, of course, had, you know, very difficult consequences for him because... Yes. Um, and it was really because of uh, the, the racist ideology of the Nazis that, you know, took hold in Germany and yes. um, must have been... Well, I mean, I can't begin to imagine what it, might, what it must have been like mm. to face that uh, mm. at that... for anybody, of course, but also mm. at that mm. time in his mm. career, mm. Uh, in, a, in a culture which he had been so intimately connected absolutely. to. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's that in, in a nutshell. Yes, he, a, a complete identification with that um, Germany, not German, not in the sense of a national boundary, but really more a cultural thing which embraces the whole German-speaking world, but also, I think, very importantly, is a particular kind of landscape that he felt enormously connected to. So, you know, the Taunus and those, those hills, those wooded hills in, in Mainz, he was equally happy when, uh, you know, I was in Heidelberg at the Odenwald and um, in, in Vienna, the Wienerwald. And it, it, there are so many aspects of hills and forest that are abs were absolutely part of something that I think he needed. Mm. But he was deprived of it, of course, eventually. But he first, he went back to uh, to Vienna after Mainz, and there were another five years or so in well, Vienna. Well, he did that very, very reluctantly. He would have had the opportunity to go to America. There were openings, but he really did not want to cut himself off completely from his his roots and for someone so uninterested in material things um, America probably would not have been good you know one had to take the dollar more seriously than I think he would have and they still had a family in Vienna but I've seen a letter from him I think to uh, to a publisher um, expressing grave misgivings about the political situation in, uh, in Austria, very open eyes about it all. Um, but I think it, it was because he was so reluctant to uproot himself. He didn't like dislocation. And was he able to make a living in those years in Vienna still? Barely. He was not able to get a proper appointment again um, and basically had to rely on private teaching and occasional work. So again, there was um, a bit of editing and um, teaching and a bit of conducting, there was a new um, a string orchestra, or was it a small orchestra, um, that he conducted occasionally. He um, took, uh, took back the, the Madrigal Society that he had founded. But it's interesting seeing the comparison between the concert programmes we have from the time up to 1933 and what they look like from the time back in Vienna. You go from glossy, really quite international programs where there would be a gal 
uh, between, I don't know, Haydn, St. Anthony uh, variations and a Brahms symphony um, or something like that, you know, as the one modern work. And then um, in Vienna, they were, you know, produced on uh, cheaply reproduced paper, I think cycler styled, uh, we called it, it, you know, I know that style of reproduction um, very well because I think I grew up with that. But the concerts were all, you know, put on by the Österreichische Komponistenbund, so the Austrian Society of Composers, and it's all the kind of names that are now becoming familiar but basically Austrian composers, the whole thing had, had shrunk massively. And the only slightly more um, better printed programme, and if you like, a more mixed programme, was a concert in Switzerland in, in 1934, I think, with the first symphony, I think. Um, so there's a massive difference. Some of the most interesting concert programmes, but on the same rather shabbily produced um, paper, were the concerts he put on himself with his Madrigal um, Society. So that included, those are amazingly interesting programmes. And uh, altogether, actually, throughout his life, his concert programs are immensely interesting, hugely mixed in periods. He never, never went for this thematic thing that you just make the whole program one, uh, uh, one thing. There were always first performances of, of, of works, so um, they were very innovative programs. Um, and, and well worth studying, I think. So that was the only opportunity with the Madrigal Society to put on the kind of programmes he wanted to. So they in themselves are very interesting. But of course then in the late 30s, people did start to leave uh, Austria as well. Uh, you know, we know that Fritz Busch, for example, had already left Germany. Well, he was, um, but, he couldn't stay, he couldn't stay on in 1933. Uh, he was treated, he was absolutely hounded out and he was not Jewish. He was simply hounded out and went to South mm. America. And then, um, could you speak a bit about the, 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 the actual emigration and, and what happened around that? Well, I think after the experience in Mainz, where first of all, my father had thought Hitler could not be taken seriously. The last Gal premiere was in February 1933 and was his violin concerto in Dresden under Fritz Busch. And um, that was also the time when they, um, you know, when my father will have played them the piano reduction of Die Biden Class, and it was all arranged that that was going to be uh, performed that year, and so on. Well, after that premiere, um, my father went to Leipzig, where there was a, um, a concert celebrating the 50th anniversary of Wagner's death, and it was the first apparently, um, occasion where Hitler had appeared in public at an event like that. And um, my father was sitting reasonably close it, it, um, and kept looking across at this man, thinking the German people could not be taken in by that face. But, you know, he was wrong. Um, Alas. Anyway, that, uh, they soon realised that they were going to compromise their friends if they stayed on in Mainz because Gestapo people were standing at the foot of the apartment where they, uh, where, where they lived and were writing down the names of anyone who visited. So that was when they decided to go to a retreat in the, in the Black Forest where I think maybe the children had previously been 
to a, a, to, to a holiday home. In any case, there was an anthroposophical school there. Um, so that was the time when my father read up on um, anth anthroposophical oh. philosophy. Rudolf Steiner. And yes. Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, my father was so widely read in Goethe and that Rudolf Steiner, you know, was, is... Um, also very influenced by Goethe. Anyway, that's when he read those things. But after four months, they realised, you know, they could not have the children at a village school forever and went back to Vienna at the end of August. And um, that was truly a difficult time. But having experienced that in Germany... In 1933. They were, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. they were more prepared than they had been in 33. The point is that Mainz had not been particularly Nazi. The, the Nazis had brought in support from Worms, apparently, to, you know, put the Nazi banners everywhere. So, I mean, there, there had been signs before, but it was not an obviously Nazi stronghold in any way. They realised that if it, if the Hitler were to have any intentions of, of getting Austria as well, that they would have to get out. And my mother left within three days, three days after the declaration of the annexation of Austria. Um, in 1938? Yeah, in March 38. And she left on her own in order to see if the borders would still be okay for my father because she was less in danger than he as a man, or that was what they thought. And then he left a week later, but not before, you know, he'd had time to see the jubilant crowds hailing Hitler as a saviour in the Heldenplatz. And your brothers? They were um, left with the grandmother and, and aunts. So my father's three sisters were there and the grandmother had to go to school in, in Vienna, which was not a good time for them. I don't think it was a nice school. And I mean, it must have been so traumatic for the parents just to leave, but it really was. Um, total emergency escape. And so just took us through this because I think they wanted to go to America originally. Yes, yeah, the, the idea was to go to America, but um, it went via Britain and you didn't get into America for 18 months because you had to get a visa. So um, you couldn't do it immediately, I think. Mm -hmm. And by the time they eventually got their visa, um, they were no longer certain about going, and also then the war started. Yes. So the 18 months, just if you work it out, even if they applied instantly for it, by September 39, war was and declared. So your brothers joined them in London eventually? Or? They, yes, at the end of August. Of 1938? Uh, of 38, mm -hmm. yes. And also uh, you mentioned that you still have furniture from Vienna, so they must have been able to get uh, quite a lot of possessions to London. Yes, my aunt Elna always talks about, you know, packing stuff up and um, uh, so, because they had to clear the, the flat, of course, it was rented accommodation. But the one sister, Gretel, also left fairly early and went to Britain. Elna um, was offered a place of refuge by Willi Reich, who was a friend of hers in Norway, um, where she was until the uh, Nazis were about to enter there. And then and, she came to Britain as well, so right. Yeah, eventually she came to Britain as well, but later. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a pianist, of course, as well. She was, she was a, a, a pianist as well, and also Willi Reich had a very good relationship to um, A.S. Neil, 
um, who, um, who founded Summerhill School, totally alternative education. He arranged really for Neil to take Anna on as a teacher at the school, as a piano teacher. So that was how she got out in 1940. Um, to Norway. To, uh, from, uh, Norway, from Norway to, from to, Norway to, England, to, yeah. uh, uh, to England. And the eldest daughter stayed in Vienna with her mother. And she is the one who then um, perished in, in Weimar. And then this aunt Jenny in Weimar invited them to join her. But meanwhile, things in Weimar just got worse and worse under the Nazi legislation. She'd had protection until then because she was married to a professor, an artist um, uh, who was Aryan, in inverted commas. And uh, also she belonged to high society there, including Nietzsche's sister and so on. So she, uh, she was okay as long as Professor Fleischer was alive. But once he wasn't, then all the anti-Jewish laws um, were just um, implemented one after the other and increasing restrictions month by month on the amount of money she could take out of her own account. And then also other people were billeted on her. So her house became a Judenhaus, a Jew house. And it's on a very, very prominent street in Weimar. Yes. On the Belvedere Allee. Yes. And yes. Uh, Jenny Fleischer, Alt, you know, such yes. a, I mean, it's, it's, it's for me, it's personally a, a very, very mm. touching story. Basically, life just became more and more impossible. My grandmother had a fall probably in March 42, and then um, sort of heart complications as a result of the fall when she was in hospital. And Jenny was no longer able to meet the costs of this. And, you know, they were well off, the Fleischers, but it was just a complete stranglehold on, on their finances. One of the people who lived in the house was Edouard Rosé. Um, and he, when he was challenged for not wearing a, um, a yellow star, said it was against his convictions, you know, because he wasn't Jewish. Um, and therefore he ended up in Buchenwald and so on. So Eduard Rosé was... Um, one of the, the people who Roman was billeted people. on the... And he was... Uh, how was he related to Arnold Rosé and Alma? Uh, brother, I think. He was the brother. And he was also a, 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 a musician yes, from... Yes, absolutely, the, uh, yes. He was, he was the um, leading cellist, I think, yeah. at the opera or something like that. And then Arnold Rosé, of course, ended up in, in Britain as well. But his daughter, Alma, uh, where, was eventually ended up in Auschwitz and uh, was tragically uh, killed there. But she was the one who was in charge of the orchestra. Of the women's orchestra. Of the women's Auschwitz. orchestra, yeah. yes. Yeah, so your families are you know, also intertwined in, in, in some ways yes. through this. And yes. so what happened then in, uh, in Weimar? So the grandmother died in March and in April, literally on the eve of deportation to Auschwitz, um, Dita and uh, Jenny Alt took their own lives. That is all extremely well documented mm. in, in Weimar and they've created some Stolpersteine. Mm -hmm. what, what do we call those? Well, the sort of um, stumbling the, stones. Stumbling stones, I suppose. Yes. yes. So they are sort of cobble, uh, you know, special cobbles. Special cobbles that are put in yeah. the road to commemorate. Yeah. To commemorate. Uh, yeah. The people yeah. who were killed or yeah. who, who were yeah. victims of, yes. of the Nazi yeah. regime. Your your family, uh, your father, your mother, and then your brothers as well, uh, arrived in Britain and and you know had to make a, a life somehow, and they were effectively refugees. Yeah, they were, they were refugees, of... and and the younger son Peter, he went to boarding school. Um, you see, my parents didn't have a home, and the other one 
was lucky enough to be old enough to be able to do evening classes. And then actually, it just looked as though they were going to have the use of a proper family house uh, for a year or something, just around the time the war started. And then because of the nightly bomb sirens and so on, which particularly affected the younger son, they realised they had to leave London. And that was when they went to Edinburgh because there was um, an offer of accommodation in return for my mother acting as housekeeper yes. with Sir Herbert Grierson. And um, the thing is that, um, or, or what we haven't talked about, is that um, my father had um, met uh, Sir Donald Francis Tovey fairly early on when they arrived in London and Tovey immediately you know wanted to bring him to Edinburgh they had already previously met in Vienna probably through Mandichevsky and um, and also Tovey was uh, on very good terms with Fritz Busch so there were all sorts of, and, and, and my father had a letter of recommendation and all that. And Tovey immediately wanted him, but didn't, uh, didn't manage to see through an appointment. But what he did manage was to uh, secure a, a visa for six months work cataloguing a special music collection um, connected with the Faculty of Music, the Reed Library. So that brought my father to Edinburgh already in autumn 38, but my mother, you know, had to stay in London. Anyway, that's how he experienced Edinburgh for six months and really liked Edinburgh. And I can imagine why he would, why he would like Edinburgh. Eventually that, of course, became the, the city where he would spend most of the rest of his life. It did indeed. It, I think that was very much in his character that he did not like uprooting himself. And having, you know, finally settled there, he was reluctant to move again. His career would have required it. He'd have had to be in London, I think. But he preferred a quiet life. That was very important to him. And he did like the Edinburgh environment very much. And I think that's to do with the hills, um, the, 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 the ups and downs in that city, and that it was a city that you could do on foot, you know. Um, and, and he met very congenial people in, 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 in Edinburgh, probably during that, and, and, and Tovey, he had um, enormous regard for Tovey. And but then Tovey died uh, during the war, didn't, didn't he? Tovey um, already became ill during the time my father was there, and it was then just a continuing decline. My father visited him often, but it was a very sad decline. And he died in 19, July 1940, I think. And my father writes an almost sort of bitter letter in the diary um, about that, you know, people just, that he was not fully recognised. And the diary you're talking about is the is diary the, of internal. Of, of the diary which we haven't talked about either. The, um, the next yes. episode, of course, yes. is, is that yes. in May 1940, uh, you know, at the beginning of the second, well, you know, the war was already going, but, uh, you know, there was the, the invasion of Belgium and, uh, the, which, uh, and, and Holland, which, of course, made Britain feel very exposed. And there was this enormous, you know, reaction against the refugees and uh, asking, you know, basically, you know, uh, Churchill locking them all up and Yeah, I don't know about them an all. enormous reaction, but certainly... It was fueled by the right-wing press, by the Daily Mail, and um, evidently did have um, resonance amongst the, uh, the politicians of the time um, to kind of scapegoat 
a fifth column for um, for losses in was it in France as well? No, there was fear later that France would be overrun. So I mean the 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 the, the diary uh, music. Hinter Stacheldraht or music behind barbed wire yeah. is actually a wonderful document. And of course, you mentioned your father's you know prose writing. It's actually really beautifully written, and yes. and also uh, you know you yourself translated this diary into English, and it's published um, by Toccata Press. Uh, so I think really it, why this, because this is such a wonderful big story, but people can read about it very well. Perhaps mm. we shouldn't dwell on it for too long in this no. conversation, no. Uh, but just to say you know he he composed while he was there, uh, a revue called What a Life, mm -hmm. and the story of that, uh, the kind of creative community f that formed mm -hmm. around it, mm -hmm. um, is, is sort of almost legendary now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, um, your father was in hospital at the time as well when he wrote this music. And uh, eventually he was released and, um, you know, he then returned to Edinburgh uh, during the war. And mm -hmm. um, so let's let's talk a bit more about maybe the the war years in Edinburgh and also then you know the the years after that. Yes, I mean the war years in in Edinburgh, I think probably weren't too awful for him. I think they had a lot of respect for the way the British conducted themselves during the war. Obviously, it was tremendously um, worrying. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the worst really was the sense of utter betrayal when um, Chamberlain made a pact with, uh, with Hitler and the kind of ignorance about what Czechoslovakia and Bohemia actually meant and, and, and so on. Um, so I think, you know, to see... My father was very politically aware, and to watch suicidal political decisions being made, that you know he could see what that was going to cause. And even earlier on, um, back in 1936 and 37, when he saw that the Allies were failing to stand up to uh, Hitler. Um, that was when he wrote his De Profundis. These, these were all works that had absolutely no prospect of performance and were for his own desk drawer. So I think things like that and, and also the, all the false premises underlying um, something like the internment, the irrationality of interning Hitler's best enemies, those things were very upsetting. Once we were in the war, I think there was um, considerable respect, as I say, for the kind of decency of the British, for the fact that the, um, the rationing system worked so well. They basically had enough where their German friends were starving and my father was always able to use his time to compose provided he had stable surroundings in which to do it. All he required really was peace and quiet. So I don't even think that was the worst time and I think he'd acquired a degree of stoic and somewhat fatalistic resignation that, you know, these things were possibly going to get worse before they got better and that basically, you know, Hitler had to be defeated. But you know, during the war, he uh, he created a Collegium Musicum with um, regular concerts in their flat in in Edinburgh, and they would um, pick a work, let's say a Bach cantata or something, and um, rehearse it in the afternoon, and then just invited guests 
would come. Uh, that started during the war when my father was um, uh, had a job as caretaker of an evacuated school. So that's where they had the space for the Collegium Musicum. So, you know, he was very resourceful in terms of music making, but the things that had already initiated by him before the internment then um, were all interrupted by the internment. So I think the internment was um, severely frustrating and I think that's why he got this terrible eczema and had to be hospitalised. Mm -hmm. But it did get him out after four and a bit months. But I think he took it much worse than a lot of other people. Well, he was also already quite a bit older than... Uh, you know, he was many... older and I think just so politically aware. You know, he was a very hard worker and then all of a sudden these people were torn away from their uh, whatever employment they, it, it, they had. So I know for some people it was like the best time of their lives because they'd never been amongst such interesting people. And looking at the people he was with, I mean, it is an amazing collection yeah. of people. That's right. And so there were other musicians, like the composer Franz Reitzenstein, for example, yes, who was much younger. Yes, yeah. um, there were uh, the musicians from the, uh, who later formed the Amadeus Quartet. That who, was different camp. There was Erwin Weiss, uh, another composer. He was there. He was in the yeah. same camp. So yeah. that's Central Camp, wasn't it? Yeah, on, in, in Douglas on the island. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, But I mean, talking about the connections, because I mean, also, of course, this was a shared experience of yes. a lot of the emigres. Yes. And I mean, he later on, he, he even wrote a suite, a piano suite, uh, based on the music of What a Life of the yeah, Revue. Not, not later, he, he, that was absolutely ready. And when he came out of the camp, I think it was his way of, of creating closure for this experience. He wrote up the diary, it was presumably just in shorthand. In, he never had anything other than really quite small pocketbooks. So we're not talking any big diary, a little thing which he wrote these things uh, in. And he typed that out when he got home. That was the first job. And the second job was to write out the suite. And then he performed that uh, as a pianist, didn't he? In, yes, in, 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 in London as in well. In a concert, you know, throughout the war. It was an astonishingly productive and active period. Um, you know, someone else would have been sick with worry, you know, when will I get a job and all the rest of it. But I think he really made the most of his time. And most astonishingly, the powers that be didn't seem to realise that he was a composer of other things than opera. So he was not banned from the BBC. His early contacts at the, um, in the Scottish BBC, Guy Warwick, Ian White, um, Trevor Harvey, I think, these people absolutely regularly performed his music. So this was... Uh, although other refugees were completely banned uh, because they were German. Uh, so it must be that he somehow was not on the list. He was barely known in this country, mm -hmm. which is, of course, well, also very Gaal, difficult. Gaal has a sort of Hungarian uh, sound to it as well, doesn't it? I mean, the, the, the surname with a with an accent on the A. I don't I mean, think they were yeah. I mean, it's aware just, of that. Who knows? Who knows? But in any case, he slipped through. See, his work was performed in London and there was the Austrian Centre and there were yes. activities of Austrian musicians. Yes. And I think among the emigre circle of musicians, yes. he was very highly regarded and oh, yes. people referred to him knowing that he was in the country. And so that also, you know, and he played in the National <laughs> Gallery concerts uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Edinburgh, absolutely regularly. And, uh, you know, all his w works, anything he would play himself was probably first performed by him in these settings. But once again, I think um, wherever he was in a position to create programmes himself, they were really interesting programmes. And he put on a concert in Edinburgh of music banned by the Nazis. 
and in a London concert, uh, a similar one, of music band by the uh, Nazis, he contributed um, four madrigals to Elizabethan songs mm -hmm. in English, which included um, a poem by Queen Elizabeth. That seems to have been composed already in 1939. I find, uh, uh, um, yeah, I find it astonishing because he only learnt English late on in the period between 33 and 38, because my mother insisted he had to learn some English, you know, in case they did have to move. And he kind of agreed when it turned out there was a teacher who lived in the same block. And that lady, by the way, Hannah Schick, um, after the war, bought a house in Altaussee in Austria, to which the, uh, the Velleses regularly went there in the summer. And they and my parents occupied the same room. So they were never there at the same time. But usually, you know, my parents just followed the Velleses to Hannah Schick. But it was only when they heard Hannah Schick in, in London speaking English that they realised this is perhaps not the English uh, one, one wanted to learn. But as I say, for, for various reasons, I don't think the war years uh, were as terrible. Uh, obviously, life was full of very, very hard times. Actually, I think it was my mother who bore the brunt of it. She was very sensitive and aware and really felt very keenly um, so many in her family who'd ended up in, in Terezin or other um, concentration camps. And she um, was... She perhaps, I think she bore the emotional pain of the sister Dita and what happened to her because she basically sacrificed herself. Mm. Yes. Well, that's a, a really important and it's, yeah. that's very hard. That still affects me as I see, yeah. Mm. Because she basically stayed with her mother when the rest had escaped. Mm. And there was your mother in Edinburgh and, you know, unable to do anything, mm. of course. So she was very, very aware of what was going on. You know, my father escaped into composition. What did your mother do in Edinburgh? I mean, you know, you mentioned that initially yeah. she worked... Uh, in, to, to, to run a household, really, and yeah. uh, but uh, how did she later on, what did she manage well, to do? Well, she um, did a course in domestic science at a college called Murray House, mm -hmm. so she did that in order to kind of um, qualify herself if, if she needed a professional qualification. What she had done in Vienna between 33 and 38 was she had done a course as a speech therapist. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the training that she did in Vienna. And she actually got a job in London as a speech therapist in a hospital. But when the war started, she lost that job mm -hmm. again. Then in Edinburgh, she did that training in domestic science so as to have a diploma of some sort. Mm. So let's talk about the time after the Second World War mm -hmm. now in Edinburgh. Uh, your father, Hans Gahl, then uh, got a, a job in the university as a lecturer in 1945. And also you just come along. And so what was the time like for your father and, and your family in that time, you know, immediately after the war? I think particularly from the time when he was able to re-establish contact with, or it was the other way around, contact um, was re-established by his former um, student, um, Otto Schmidtkin, in, in Wiesbaden. Mm -hmm. I think that was very 
important. So that reconnected him again, and it was Schmidtkin who then premiered De Profundis. Um, so I think the first letter was from 1946, mm -hmm. um, and you know, the work was then duly premiered and in every single season Otto Schmidtkin performed some girl. At the same time in Britain, Rudolf Schwarz was doing performances because he became conductor of the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Every kind of major orchestral work he, he performed. So I think he's the only person who actually performed all my father's symphonies in his, in his lifetime. And Could you say a bit more about Rudolf Schwarz and yes, where was he, he from? Had been, he had been my father's student in Vienna, um, or pupil rather, um, and he um, had had a very hard time during the war, Belsen concentration camp and so on. And then, more dead than alive, he um, needed rehabilitation in Sweden, married a Swedish wife. But, you know, eventually he came back and resumed a career in Britain as a conductor. And he definitely performed, you know, wherever he had the opportunity, he, he performed um, Hans Gahl. So uh, th th those were the things that gave my father a tremendous, uh, a tremendous lift. Um, Schmidtkin in Germany, pretty well every year he premiered a Gahl work, so, so much that had been composed, as it were, for his desk drawer, as he saw it himself, then was actually performed. And above all, he was able to return to Germany and um, a year later to, to Vienna and um, connect again with, uh, with, with the publishers, Reitkopf and, and Schott, who were in, Mainz, uh, in, in Wiesbaden and Mainz, and, and so on. So I think that, um, that reconnection was very important to him, but the fact is, that the people who performed Gal were people like um, uh, uh, Rudolf Schwarz, who had been his pupil in, in, in Vienna, and Otto Schmidtkin, who had been his student in Mainz. So it's, it, it was that direct connection. And then in Edinburgh, I mean, I suppose you were saying, you know, he had a, a stable job there, which I suppose also the time after the war was a difficult time in Germany and Austria as well. It was a and, very difficult you know, time there. Mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and I've seen from the correspondence with Otto Schmidtkin how important the parcels were that my parents regularly sent the Schmidtkins because they were, they were starving. And so, you know, th that may explain also, you know, one might ask, would he have considered going back to live in Germany or in Austria. Um, but I mean, of course, that was a very, you know, I think for many refugees who'd left Germany who had experienced the discrimination and the, the racial, you know, persecution and all that, you know, that was a, a step too far. So he was reconnecting, but think, he wouldn't have considered. I don't think that a job was ever, a convincing job was ever offered. There was an offer from Vienna but it was not in any way um, a really secure job. And um, my father had just, you know, acquired uh, British nationality in, in uh, 1946, I think. And he didn't like, he didn't like being moved. <laughs> um, so uh, he did not really trust the Vienna offer. But the fact is that um, 
when he was back in Wiesbaden, where, where the Schmidtkins now, uh, now lived, he was conductor of the Wiesbaden Symphony Orchestra, so that was now the centre. Um, uh, it was just, an, uh, or, or going back to, to Vienna, it was a return to a place where he belonged, but didn't belong. So it's not a straightforward thing, um, but at least to visit and reconnect with those people who were his friends and to have his music performed was good. And I think the, therefore that kind of early 50s when this was happening both in Germany and in, in Britain, um, uh, those and, and a, a lot of broadcasts actually um, you know 1949 I think that single year had possibly eight performances of an, uh, a Pickwickian overture that he'd written fairly early on in arriving in, 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 in Britain so I think in the end that's probably what mattered to him and stability and congenial surroundings um, where they lived in, in Edinburgh, you know, you could walk to the university, you could walk to the King's Theatre, um, very, very well connected and you were looking out on um, a green. And then there was the Edinburgh Festival of course which had been established and uh, which Rudolf Bing, uh, you know, was very instrumental in, but uh, your father was also involved and in Well, it, it, connected. very much involved right at the beginning because Bing, you know, asked my father about, because the, they knew each other from, uh, from Vienna, um, whether Edinburgh would be a prospect for um, a Scottish Salzburg, because, of course, with the castle and everything, there were obvious similarities. And, you know, my father said, you're impossible. Um, however, it was my father who directed Bing towards Lady Rosebery, who um, was a great supporter of my father. And I, he had given her piano lessons and played duets with her. And my pram was a Rosebery pram. She enjoyed my father's company and she was the one who could seriously do something about helping uh, to find finance for the Edinburgh Festival. Anyway, in 1947 it started and yes, I think my father was heavily involved because a little bit like his introductions in the miniature scores, I recognised the kind of programmes that and the people who came, but it was so remarkable three years after the end of a war against Austrian Germany to have people like Bruno Walter, um, uh, Ford Wengler, um, Ernst von Dochnani, um, just international figures, but particularly from the countries against which uh, Britain had been at war, coming to conduct, and the Vienna Philharmonic and so on. Leinborn was also doing performances in Edinburgh. Yes, um, but there again, you know, my father had his big connection with Fritz Busch, and yes. Busch was and the uh, was was the leading light there, and my father was involved in um, a, a rearrangement of Idomeneo for uh, for Leinborn. But yes, Leinborn was a fixture. Leinborn came every year. And then uh, Erna Gahl, also, your, your aunt. She became a repetitor uh, slightly later, but in those early years of, of Glyndebourne, during the festival, um, uh, various paying guests would come to the house who were connected with the festival and probably quite a few of them connected with Glyndebourne because you can imagine the number of people who had to come. Of course, apart from the full-time lectureship at uh, you know, the music department at Edinburgh University, 
Uh, your father also conducted, uh, you know, orchestra, the, the, the chamber orchestra. They, the, he was involved with the Edinburgh Society of Musicians, with the Society of Recorder Players. Um, you know, there were so many activities that connected him with the local community. Yes, he was always very, very committed to that and um, it, it, everything that involved music making. Uh, yes, and and the recorder connection from the start of the society, the establishment of the Society of Recorder Players in Edinburgh, he was their honorary president. But I remember when um, it wasn't Dolmetsch on that occasion, it was Walter Bergman who had been interned in Central Camp as well, and Edgar Hunt came to Edinburgh to kind of create interest in the recorder and uh, consider the setting up of a society. And I think that's, I think my first recorder was one that came through, I think he was called Edgar Hunt. So, um, so, you know, my father involved himself in that and then came the connection with Karl Dolmetsch. And as things got very difficult for, the, for German music and particularly traditional rather than second Viennese school, um, the fact that Dolmetsch had a Wigmore Hall recital every year, I think, and always needed new chamber music and so on. Uh, that encouraged a lot of new works from my father so he, because he, that was an yeah. opportunity to be performed, and he basically. Wrote, so he wrote for the recorder? And, um, uh, yes, yeah. he wrote. Well, he first wrote for me because I, um, I bought this first recorder with prize money from a competition festival of under 11 Bach class, I think. And um, my best friend came to the house to play with me and she brought her fiddle and I um, had my new recorder. And we hadn't quite finished breakfast when my friend arrived and um, my dad slipped out of the room and five minutes later he came with a duet for Charlotte and for me. And uh, that was, uh, he subsequently added uh, four more movements and made a whole suite. Uh, but that's published and dedicated to Charlotte and Eva. And that was, that was the recorder and violin. So that was the first one. And then he wrote an awful lot more for recorders. And then, so you played the violin as well yeah. and the piano. Yeah. Um, and you played to a very high level, and there was, uh, was what, there was chamber music in in the home where, as you grew up, with my friend Charlotte and two others, Jan Schlapp, who later became um, principal viola of the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, mm -hmm. um, which actually her husband was one of the founders of. Um, she was our viola player. And she and Charlotte were at school with me. We were all in the same class. And our cellist, Christopher Elton, um, was head of piano at the Academy, Royal Academy, for a very, very long time mm -hmm. and on many juries. But he was, our, he was our cellist. So, and he's the same age, but was at the, um, the boys' school, which is in a different location at that time. It's co-ed now. Um, so we were all the same age and we had a quartet once a month um, with my father in the background with a score. Just if something went wrong, he helped to get it fixed and we, and we carried on. And he brought us all the music from the Reed Library, which was like his library that he knew inside out. Uh, and put it on the stands. And the object of the exercise was to play the music, you know, not to prepare for um, any uh, incredibly um, important events usually, but just, just to play really and, and, and experience the repertoire. So there was, there was a, 
uh, yeah, I suppose quite active home life and uh, with with your as you're growing up you making music and um, people did people come to the house to have lessons as well yes yes yes, yes. and we're talking about the house now it's so in 1953 I think mm -hmm. we moved to Blackett Place you, yeah. you moved to a really yeah. nice house yeah. in Edinburgh yeah uh, but the house before the flat in Warrender Park Crescent also had an enormous um, sitting room with a big bay window looking over this big green, the, the Lynx it's called, um, and that's where the Collegium Musicum moved to when my parents moved out of that evacuated school and uh, uh, finally had their own flat. That was... Um, so there were house concerts uh, happening uh, uh, there? Well, there was this regular Collegium Musicum and apparently my mother's teas were legendary because she made these open sandwiches, you know, belegte Brötchen, um, which was simply a tradition that she came from. But my parents, or well, my mother, managed very, very well with the, with the rationing. She, she just knew other cuts, cuts of meat one could use and so on. So, I mean, certainly um, the, the attitude to it that I've absorbed from them was that basically they had enough and it was fine. Mm -hmm. And music was the most important thing. Um, and I mean, I'm just, you know, we're sitting in your music room here in mm. York mm. and I can just get a sense that, I mean, even some of the furniture here get, gives me a similar sort of continental feeling of a, mm. of a sort mm. of salon at home, which, um, so that's what I Im imagine as well mm. when you describe mm. These, mm. these occasions. Um, so perhaps we can talk a bit more about uh, sort of other compositions from the time after the war. I mean, so your father had this position at Edinburgh University. He retired yeah. in 1955. That's when uh, he was... He had to, he had to sort of, but he, he actually then, continued teaching um, until, uh, for another 10 years. So that would have been until 1975. Yes. And then he lived until 1987. Yes. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a long period of, of very settled life in Edinburgh. Yeah. But during that time, you know, many, many things, of course, happened. And you, he did have uh, these, these concerts in Germany. But I suppose that dried up a little bit uh, after, in, in the 1950s. Well, um, uh... Otto Schmidtken um, died quite early in 1964, and <coughs> uh, Rudi Schwarz um, didn't always have jobs where he could do it. When he had a position that allowed him to, like conducting Northern Symphonia, that's where he, um, he did perform my father's fourth symphony, which is a Sinfonia Concertante. Uh, so that was quite late in the day, you know, in, in, uh, in 1970, I think, or even, even, even later, even later, 74, perhaps. Um, but then uh, there was something happened to his hearing that he heard everything uh, a minor third at a different pitch, um, a third down or something, and he found that intolerable, and then the conducting stopped. Yeah. But that that was. Um, but basically, things declined more and more. But you asked about works that mm, yes. works from that time. Well. Uh, the violin concerto I mentioned, that was the last thing that was, that was a new work, another new work from the uh, early 30s that was premiered in 33. The um, cello concerto was composed in 1944 and the piano concerto um, at the end of the 40s, I think, um, and all these works, you know, were sort of published in the early 50s or so, once things established a bit. But we were already getting to a period where 
performances became less and less, and then the Glock years, they suddenly said, um, oh, uh, we've got to um, have not an audition, but examine every, every uh, you know, a manuscript needs to be submitted. Well, they did that for the, um, uh, for this puppet play overture, you know, it had been an international uh, success. And then uh, Sir Adrian Bolt uh, writes, you know, you've got to submit a manuscript. So my father hit the roof and that was that. So it was very much a change of fashions, really. And, oh, it was uh, an, an extreme change of fashion. And um, people who had previously um, really enjoyed playing his music suddenly did really avant-garde stuff. But anyway, you know, new works were the, the cello concerto, the piano concerto, the Second Symphony was actually composed in 1942, but wasn't published until 10 years later. And then the Third Symphony um, is a product of the early 50s, and the Fourth not till the 70s. All these developments in uh, post-war music, both in Britain and in Germany, and we're talking about the Darmstadt School and, uh, you know, some, you know, radical experiments that were happening in Britain as well. I mean, your father would have witnessed all this, you know, He into witnessed the all of that. He, um, and it just wasn't something he could get on with at all. Because um, it simply didn't correspond to what he understood music to be. I mean, of course, he, as, a, as an academic, um, you know, he would have, you know, studied it and um, but did, would, do you think he had a, did, did he, did he speak about this, these kinds of developments? Did he follow them and did he sort of judge them from his point of view? Well, he was well? aware of everything that was going on, but he was also very quick to reject what was not congenial yeah. to, uh, to him. Um, so he was basically very isolated in that, uh, in that period and simply continued composing in his way and um, making the most of such performances as there were. Um, but it was a little bit, you know, on the sidelines. You know, he didn't really have um, a place in London. He didn't have... Uh, really a major British champion. He never did. Now, do you think that was a big disappointment for him or did he feel that it's just a natural course of, of history or I'm life? I'm quite sure it was a major disappointment. Yes. These fashions that took over, um, he could see, you know, how empty in, in his terms most of this was. Um, so it was just, you know, uh, not for him. But also reviews at that time were extremely patronising. And people ceased to be able to understand the nature of German music and regarded everything with a contrapuntal structure, which is integral, um, as academic or thematic work. All these things that are integral um, to that style were, you know, just dismissed as academic or uh, dry or, you know, neoclassical. Uh, he, he did not and still does not fit any, uh, any easy label. You can't ha hang him on to a single peg. You can't do it with nationality. Um, uh, you know... It's not straightforwardly an Austrian composer, although he's Austrian born. It's not straightforwardly a British composer, definitely not. Not straightforwardly a Jewish uh, composer. Um, uh, the conservative label absolutely doesn't fit the man. As, as you know from the diary, he was not a conservative. Absolutely 
not, you can tell from his, his, his kind of attitudes and, and um, his, 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 his values. Um, but, you know, we were in an intellectual and aesthetic environment where progressive meant uh, Schoenberg school atonality. I mean, the Adorno teaching really took over. It's so interesting, isn't it, that the, I mean, the, you, you mentioned this sort of the labeling and the fact that he didn't fit into any of those mm. sort of um, expected boxes. That's one of his problems with, with the revival now, because people want it to, it's much easier if you fit into a box. But at the same time, um, you know, there, there was enormous integrity and, and continued integrity by being true to his roots. And, oh, total you know, integrity. So uh, integrity, you're right, is absolutely central to who he is, who he, uh, who he was. Um, but that doesn't help um, with labelling. Because he, what he represents is pretty complex and cuts across a lot of those, a lot of those labels, both stylistic and national labels. So Scottish, you know, people can um, adopt him as a Scottish composer, as a Jewish composer, as a German music, as an Austrian composer, but... Um, you know, then he won't be Scottish enough for the Scottish lobby and not Austrian enough for the Austrian lobby and not Jewish enough for the Jewish lobby. But you see, that says more about the state of our culture yes. than it says about him. Yeah. Because the, yeah. the need for having uh, somebody who conforms with the expectation of yeah. Yeah. whatever lob yeah. lobby. You could also say, on the other hand, that it's great that so many different camps can extract something from Gaal uh, to be relevant to them, and you know the, the Scottish rap, the Scottish Rhapsody, a beautiful mm -hmm. uh, cello mm -hmm. piece, and mm -hmm. the, the, you know you already mentioned the the Elizabethan madrigals, and um, at the same time, you know, I mean, in in any way, I'm fascinated how the integrity of following his 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 path, um, you know, is has such a it, it's, it seems so solid, and of course he did develop his style. It, he didn't write in 1965 like he did write no. in the 1920s. It's, no, you're absolutely you know, right. So I mean, we just recorded um, these, uh, you know, these what late, beautiful, uh, you know, uh, late preludes. piano preludes yeah. uh, in, in 1965. They mm, are, mm. and you know, it is wonderfully innovative music, and he definitely has this this integrity of. Of, of, of using mm -hmm. all his experience and all his, mm -hmm. you know, lifetime of, mm -hmm. um, but also he re references, of course, the Chopin preludes, and you could think you're referencing Bach as well with, with mm -hmm. the choice of this mm -hmm. uh, writing in all the different keys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, do you want to say something about these well, pieces? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the preludes are from uh, in 1960. I remember it because he sort of made a joke of, you know, giving it to himself for his... Uh, 70th birthday. Yes, I mean, um, uh, he writes somewhere, I mean, or it's, in, it's quoted uh, from a, a conversation that, you know, if Bach um, uh, had to write in, in uh, you know, 24 to cover each, of the, to show that each of these keys um, could it, it could be it could be used? Uh, perhaps today one has to write to show that it, one can still write um, in all all the yes. keys, um, and still write like he did write. Yes. And, and although there were so many people who just believed, and it's an irrational belief, really, that one couldn't write like that anymore. Yeah. But it's a it's a move for him in the direction of conciseness brevity, um, an exploration of piano, of, of piano um, te technique um, in, 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 in the preludes. Yeah, I mean, it was something he hadn't done before. And a lot of his, um, a, a lot of his compositions are 
some combination that he has not done before. So, you know, each time it's finding the appropriate form and, and structure for a different instrumental combination, or in this case, for piano solo. Um, yes, you see, he never doubted the validity of, of, of tonality for, uh, for him. He accepted that some people, uh, he likened it to gravity, and, you know, he knew that weightlessness exists, but, you know, he needed uh, gravity, and for him it was like kind of law of nature. Um, it was just as self-evident for him. As, as, as that, really. He affirmed his roots in this way also by writing books, didn't he? I mean, that's something... That was not necessarily what he had a primary urge to do. That, that was instigated by um, a publisher, uh, Fisher, um, because um, someone had suggested uh, that really the person who would know most about Brahms actually was Hans Gall. So he was invited to write uh, the Brahms book. So that was actually number one. Mm -hmm. And then, so when was that approximately? 60, 61, 62, yeah. thereabouts. And, I and then there was a whole series. Could you just uh, mention who, other composers that he wrote about? Yes, he his next book I think was Wagner because Wagner to him was a very interesting phenomenon of you know a monstrous man in many ways who wrote extraordinary music and it was trying to balance the monster with the genius uh, somehow without having to um, efface one or the other, that, that interested him. So there's the Brahms monograph? Yes. Then there's um, a, a, uh, Wagner? Yes, then there was Schubert. I think that's possibly the only one that um, he wrote of his own accord. Um, and then he did a Verdi. Mm -hmm. That's probably the least well-known of his books and, and was also the latest. And that, I think, has not been translated into English. So did he write those monographs in German and then they were translated? Yeah, they were all, those, those were all German, yeah. yes. But he, his first book in this country was in 1948, The Golden Age of Vienna, which again is remarkable for someone who had seen what he'd seen in in Vienna and what's more the series was edited by Otto Erich Deutsch with whom he was interned with whom he was interned but yes. who, who went back to live in in in, in Austria I, I think, think yes. so mm -hmm. I think I think I think you're right but his daughter lived in this country Gita Gita Deutsch I, I, I met her a very nice lady no she also lived in Vienna sorry she lived in Vienna but perhaps we can speak about a few more um, emigres who also lived in this country. And um, I mean, I know that, um, you know, Edinburgh was not London, so he may not have been quite so close to other emigres in Britain. But um, I know that Karl Rankel, for example. Yes, you know, Karl we... Rankel um, was a good friend. Um, all the, the emigre figures who became conductors of the Scottish National Orchestra, uh, had a Friday concert each week. And they were, uh, the, you know, the ones that were my, my father's friends were invited for tea between the rehearsal and the concert. So at that time, Karl Rankel visited very regularly but I also remember visiting him and his and his wife in the Salzkammergut when we finally were able to go back 
to Austria. Because Karankel did move back to Austria for yes. the, after. I think he, he was Since at, I've come he was first at Royal Opera House until 1951, yes. and then I think in Glasgow, yeah. and yes. then um, in Sydney for a few years, but then uh, settled uh, yeah. in Austria. Well, we didn't go as a family until um, 1958, when he won the Austrian State Prize for the second time, and it was a money prize. And he used that to pay for a family holiday in Austria. And we went via Wiesbaden, so we stayed at the Schmidtkins and so on. And then in, in, uh, in, in Austria, in the Salzkammergut. And it was not till 1961, or when, when he finally got some reparation money from Germany, Mm -hmm. that we then, we went to Austria every year. But that was not possible before. It was possible that one time with, with the prize. And otherwise he, he traveled for performances when he was able to. So this recognition your father received in Austria and then Germany and also compensation, surely inadequate, but uh, there was some, um, I mean, how did he relate and also how was it for you to travel to Germany and Austria knowing what had happened to your and your family? I knew very little about what had happened. You know, there's, there's a story that I have told many times um, about the general knowledge test we had at school when I must have been 10 or 11 and the question was, Compared, uh, recently this country was at war against whom? And I didn't know, so I, I, get, I made my best guess and wrote the English. <laughs> the Scottish road at war Absolutely with Absolutely good Scottish education. And um, <clears throat> this was reported back to my because I think the teacher was quite amused and it was reported back to my parents and you know I think they were quite proud of themselves because they wanted me to be assimilated and not weighed down um, with all of that no I mean I heard completely new things when my father was amongst his old friends you know that first time in Austria went via Hendorf, um, uh, a village uh, in, in the area of Salzburg, but not in Salzburg. Uh, this, uh, uh, it's the sort of place that the Viennese um, would have their country cottages in, um, in, in the whole uh, Salzkammergut area. And um, you know, so this was an amazing meeting up with old friends. Also, Georg Sell had a, an incredible um, palatial uh, place uh, in the region as, as, as well. So, you know, these trips to Austria were an opportunity to stop off en route um, in, in Wiesbaden and you know, then, then a night in Hendorf. It took three days to get there. We already mentioned Egon Welles once when we spoke you know, about in, yeah, in Vienna. Yeah. Um, and I know that Welles also, of course, who, he settled in Oxford and mm. you know, mm. also had a mm -hmm. career as an as a academic there. Uh, but of course, you did point out the differences between them because, of course, Vélez had actively chosen also a parallel academic career. He had um, chosen to go there, yes. But then also Vélez also after the war went back to Austria and, and Vienna, and mm. you know there are also mm. interviews mm. with mm. Vélez about mm. uh, you know that experience and how you know he mm. feels felt mm. so connected mm. to mm. to Vienna. Now the question is, I mean, twofold really. Um, did did your father and Egon Vélez in some ways? parallel lives. Did they connect in Britain? Did they have much to do with each other? They, they didn't have much to do with each other, but um, it, it, through this kind of meeting in Alta um, they sometimes just overlapped, because I, I, I think I can remember 
overlapping there, but perhaps I'm just imagining that I can remember it. Um, I think they probably didn't, uh, they probably had more in common then than they would have had earlier on in Vienna, is my guess. But they were always honoured at the same time because they were exactly five years apart. So um, it was, it, 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 you know, the centenaries and the anniversaries with the fives and the tens um, always coincided. So they were brought together a lot. And when I've listened to interviews with Egon Veles, I've really been struck by the parallels. So, of course, there's an awful lot that would then bind them, uh, bind them together. But perhaps more in later years than in earlier. Now, let's talk a bit more maybe about your own memory of your father as a musician and as a as a you know as a, as a person who talked about music um, how would you describe his musicianship and and I know you, you know you obviously you played yourself in the house you had, he coached you many times mm. um, what's your memory of his musicianship it was just incredibly to the point it was uh, very much rec making the um, the performance work at a structural level where the music was going. Um, he was more interested in that probably than in details of sound quality, but direction, movement, um, uh, fluidity, um, integrity of the rhythm. He had no time for the wrong rubato or for... Um, the kind of early music style where you compensate, as it were, for not being able to lean on a note expressively, then you, you know, you hold on to it rhythmically. No time for that at all. So the 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 shape and character of the music he had a tremendous understanding of, and a very small thing that would make all the difference to how it, uh, how, how, it, how it worked. A real inside understanding, I would say. And, you know, I suppose the authority that came from that, from that understanding. And I know that you still play the violin and you also, do you still play the piano as well sometimes? If I have someone to play for, I only play when I've got someone to play with. Or, or, or actually, I never sit down and just play. It's awful. It's one of those things that still remains to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside all the books that are saying, why haven't you read me yet? No, I mean, it seems ridiculous that I don't sit down and just play things. But it doesn't seem to happen. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear you play <laughs> sometime. Um, but it is, um, you know, and if you now, you know, you, I know you're also a keen concert goer and, uh, you know, it, you, you still appreciate music very deeply mm. as well, mm. um, I'm sure. No, I, I normally um, play uh, violin sonatas regularly and the orchestra I play in, which normally has three concerts a year, has only been doing stuff online. And York Opera hasn't been doing a live opera. I played in York Opera for years, years and years and years. So um, I've also experienced a lot of music by playing. And my father regularly played piano duets with me, basically whenever I wanted to. And again, he would go and get the, fetch the music. And that was a way of getting to know the uh, symphonic repertoire, um, but even some chamber music like sextets as piano duets. So that's, you know, those are the two things my, the two things my father contributed to massively in my upbringing were the string quartets from the age of 12 to 18, once a month, um, and um, 
the piano duets. But my mother's contribution to the quartets was vital because, um, you know, kids of that age don't necessarily want to spend their Sunday playing quartets, however nice. But my mother made terrific cake and the cake and the break was a big feature of our Sundays. You know, there was always chocolate cake or cheesecake or something, and that was hugely appreciated. And did your mother play an instrument as well? No, I think my mother was marrying a man who was 12 years older and um, had already kind of thought through all the things that she was just Uh, discovering, I think somehow she she didn't do her own thing. I think in retrospect that that was a great loss and that she should really have done far more, followed far more of her own things. But it was interesting that, um, you know, the two years after he died when she, she was no longer looking after him as, uh, you know, her really central um, raison d'etre. Um, there the was um, a young friend, for instance, the wife of the music, um, the professor of music, um, who was 50 or something, uh, actually booked um, uh, classes with my mother, like art appreciation class and this sort of thing, you know, and then they would come back to our house for lunch. It was really, really nice. So rather than looking after this old lady, she actually booked the same class. And so they would meet up doing that sort of thing. And my mother went to the French Institute um, regularly and carried on doing her translation classes, you know, I think, probably well into her 80s. So um, my mother was it was obviously musical enough to have um, chosen this Hans Gahl quartet, which brought them together um, at the age of 18. And I think she was quite intellectually uh, precocious, but I think her own personal development in, in, uh, was was put on hold a bit with being married to a man who got on with his work while she was left to do the domestic life. <laughs> so your father died in 87 and yeah. uh, and he was very active until very late in his life. Yeah. I think he I played in... trios with him um, with Simon as well. Um, less than Simon, a week son. before, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. less than a week before he died. Simon was just old enough to be able to, you know, sight read a Beethoven trio or something. And so we went to Edinburgh on the train with Simon with his cello and um, played a little trio by my father and a Beethoven. Mm -hmm. And so, that was and six days before he died. Wow. And you, you must have left Edinburgh, Edinburgh in, the, um, in the 60s uh, at some stage? Um, I left Edinburgh finally in 1970, uh -huh. when Tony got a job at Leeds University. Yes, and so we Tony. went to Leeds yes. and... Um, no, I mean, I, I had a job in Heidelberg as a, a language assistant, like Torin. Uh, straight after graduating. Mm -hmm. So I did that from 66 to 68, came back to Edinburgh. Um, Tony and I got married in that year. Um, we had our part of the Edinburgh house. So we lived there then until we had our own kitchen and everything, but we basically lived in my parents' house until Tony got the job in Leeds. And a year later, I got the academic job in York. And then your parents were Yeah, uh, on their own in, in on Edinburgh. their own in the house, yes. And so after your father died, and then two years on uh, later, your your mother died as well. Yes, um, which was a shame because she was just beginning to build up a, a life. You know, people realized that actually Hannah um, 
needed a lift to get to places because otherwise she would suddenly think, well, I'm tired now, I don't feel like it. And even in her last week of life, I think she must have been out three, three times, you know, at various things. And what, after that, I mean, I know, well, we met first, I think, in the early 2000s. Yes. Um, when we were recording the, the music yes. of What a Life. And I, was, I became very much aware that, that you and also Simon, your son, and Tanya, your daughter, um, you were really committed as a family unit to supporting your father's legacy. Yeah. And is that something that, did that happen already during their li your father's lifetime or was that something? It was just starting. Tony made the first list of works. Um, there was this cupboard that had all sorts of manuscripts and everything anyway. And I don't even know if uh, my father was that happy to see, you know, his stuff got out. But anyway, Tony, with our first BBC computer, made a, a complete list of works. And that was a kind of start of something that one... So we were just beginning to get interested sort of around 1980-84. But then also through my contacts at York Opera, um, in my father's last year of life, um, a group from York Opera performed um, extracts from Die Heilige Ente with me and their main repetitor on the piano. We, we, we did the piano reduction with two of us. Believe me, those are hard, those piano reductions. Um, and that worked very well. But I was the one that did the, uh, uh, did the job of, of um, choosing the bits, which is not easy because it's a through composed work. And actually, I also, because I was teaching in a department of English and related literature that could include quite a lot of cultural connections and everything, um, used the opportunity to include research on words and music and this sort of thing that I'm interested in anyway. And I prepared work on Heilige Ente for a, a conference. And I was in, I was a founder member of the Comparative Literature, uh, Literature Society in, in Britain. And, you know, we had a organized a conference on words and music and so on. So I, I was involved in interdisciplinary work. I think that's why York was the right place for me, uh, because I'm interested in larger connections. Um, literature, I would rather think, you know, in terms of the European uh, literature than just English literature as a, as a national thing. But um, so the interest was and the commitment were already there very early. But I do remember that when I was in doing my year abroad as a student in Freiburg and I was studying at the music college there during that year. Um, and I learned that it wasn't clever to keep talking about my daddy. You know, it was just, um, it was not the right time or place to, to do it. But, you know, I had to learn that. So I think I was already actually pretty, pretty committed, but it, it's been a gradual process. And, you know, Tony involved himself very much 
from the outset. And then you started the Hans Gard Society as well. Yes, well, that was, that was something we were very much encouraged to do. I mean, Gerald, Geraldine Auerbach helped me enormously in just getting that moving. It is, I mean, for an, so somebody from the outside, it is very, very impressive to see that commitment and that enduring commitment in your life to your father's music. And well, I think that's because anyone who has really worked with that music um, recognises its supreme value. But you have to have really been, uh, it got into it fairly deeply. If you listen to it on the surface, and that applies to performance as well, and, and people have said as much. You know, it'll be pleasant, um, but um, it, it, nothing so special. And it depends incredibly on the level of performance for it, for it to work. But a good performance, even of works that I thought were really not of great interest, when I finally hear them, properly played, they're absolutely transformed. So, you know, it's very hard actually to find um, a poor work, but we've had many <laughs> poor performances, you know, particularly in the 50s and 60s. Um, so it's taken quite a long time. And um, in Germany, if anything, they struggle even more with understanding what to do with the style, because they then they think, oh, it's all late romantic, and do a completely excessive sort of rubato. I mean, you know, college tutors who... Uh, certainly what they're doing is not what Hans Gahl himself would have done. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's not... It's not what he would have done. So I, th I think the commitment is because of the, um, uh, because of th the quality of the music mm -hmm. and what it means to us, and therefore some sort of need to share that and to get that out. Mm -hmm. Well, you've certainly managed to do a lot of that, and it's been. Um, you know, for me, you know, I've known you for many years, but it's been really interesting to see how that drive to communicate about this has really, you know, borne fruit, and uh, you know how so many recordings have now been made and recordings the operas have, have been happened. taken up again. Um, yes, mm. that's just uh, just the start, um, but it was wonderful when Das Lied der Nacht happened, and the extraordinary thing was that. Um, at a committee meeting of the Hans Gahl Society, we had just committed ourselves to putting on some sort of concert performance of Das Lied der Nacht in Edinburgh in June, and obviously on a shoestring because there was no money. Uh, but we'd, you know, pick the person who would uh, somehow manage the musical side and so on. Um, and... A week later, I get the letter from Osnabrück. Um, we are uh, staging Das Lied der Nacht and premiere 4th of April. And, and ours was, was or, or, or something in April, or was it end, end of April? No, I think it was the very end of April and ours was 4th of June. I mean, That's after... Right. Uh, you know, it hadn't been heard since 1930. So there is interest in, in Germany now. I mean, we talked about this before, uh, earlier, about the different uh, sort of aspects to the, the, the heritage that, you know, your father's music represents and how it, you know, connects with many different camps. But what was also fascinating is that, I mean, you know, you, you're talking about making connections and a more European perspective. And of mm, course, mm. you could say, you know, this is a very much a European uh, 20th century life. Um, and it's, it's that 
the complexity of it, but also the, the whole picture that in itself makes so much sense. He was a European, uh, absolutely. I mean, he's turning in his grave at what's happening now politically. <laughs> Completely. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, we you know we saw the other day that the Amadeus Quartet in, mm. in the 1970s, when Britain joined the European mm. Union, mm. campaigned so that many British would subscribe to that and, and actually tr campaigned for Britain joining the European Union. Yes. And I think from the experience of uh, you know of this generation of refugees, of of people who managed to 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 build their lives across these divides mm. and of course having had the experience of this um, mm. cultural multiplicity mm. as well mm. which ultimately is enriching I, yeah. would, I would say it's enriching yes um, you know and I think that's what what one can celebrate about their lives and their achievements as mm. well mm. Mm. and so hopefully uh, you know this this migration experience can be validated in a, in a positive way and also the music can be seen in that context and, and precisely because it transcends the narrower labels that's right and so it is it's hard to find your champions but i think what you're saying is is very true for its more universal validity and i think that's another reason i think for it hopefully to have some sort of enduring value well, thank you. I think that's a good note to finish on. <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing your memories and, uh, of course, your, your passion for your father's mm. uh, music and, and story. Is there anything you want to, to, to say, anything else you would like to say? No, I think thank you very much for, um, yes, for coming to do this and for giving me the opportunity to talk about something I am uh, passionate about. But I just think, you know, everything that I read um, uh, from him uh, feeds that passion rather than disappointing it. Yes, and I think, well, I can only agree and uh, I mean having spent yesterday in the studio uh, hearing a mm. tremendous performances of these preludes um, you know I felt exactly the same mm. so thank you again and uh, I hope that you know other people will find this interesting and, and engage you. with the story more and discover more of this music and also you know of the stories that are connected with it thank you very much Norbert thank you